Welcome to the revolution. I have a feeling you may be thinking, did I come to the wrong room this morning? I'm not here for a revolution. I'm just here to worship God for an hour and then go on with my life. Yeah, so about that, you are in the right place. We are worshiping here this morning, but it may take more than an hour. The bad news is it's probably going to require a bit more than that, probably about your whole life. Welcome to the revolution. It turns out Jesus is a bit of a revolutionary. Well, more than a bit. He basically subverts everything we know about strength and power and justice and love and forgiveness and service. He came into our world to launch God's revolution, a kingdom revolution, a revolution of the spirit, a world-changing movement that would overcome evil with good and hatred with love. He called his followers to pray radical prayers like, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, meaning the displacement of the corrupt kingdoms of this world by the perfect reign of God. That's revolutionary language. Now, admittedly, we don't always think of Jesus as a revolutionary. Author Michael Brown writes, all too often we look at Jesus as the founder of a lovely home and garden religion called Christianity, a harmless spiritual leader who left behind some lovely platitudes and inspirational thoughts, a man whose memory we celebrate at the annual Easter egg hunt. But that was hardly the Jesus of the New Testament. The message of Jesus was a threat to the religious establishment. He called for dramatic, sweeping, yes, revolutionary change. He touched lepers. He talked to women openly in the daytime. He told the first they were really last, and the last they were really first. He promised freedom to captives. He ate with social outcasts. He disrupted business activities at the temple. He was killed as a political criminal. How much more revolutionary can you get? But Jesus wasn't your run-of-the-mill revolutionary. This was nothing like the American Revolution with its musket-toting Minutemen or the French Revolution with its storming of the Bastille. For this revolution, there was no armed revolt, no funny hats, no color red. Jesus would not fight violence with violence. His revolution did not come by a sword or guns or bombs, but by a basin and towel and turning the other cheek. Jesus revolutionized what a revolution looks like. And the more we walk alongside this revolutionary revolutionary, the more radical his invitation to follow me sounds. We feel that, I think, as we journey through the Gospel of Mark. The narrative has shifted. Jesus's focus has turned toward Jerusalem, and he keeps trying to tell the disciples what that means, and they have so much trouble understanding. We have trouble understanding this revolution that's underway. So maybe we can empathize a bit with the man who stops Jesus on the road. 
He wants to be close to God. He wants to live an abundant, eternal life. And he, he just wants to know what he has to do to make that happen. Who can blame him? He's a very practical guy, right? Just tell me what to do and I'll do it. He's also apparently a bit of an overachiever because it seems like he's already checked everything off his checklist. He hasn't murdered. He hasn't stolen anything. He hasn't slept with anyone else's wife. He's got a good relationship with his parents. I mean, he's just a decent bloke who wants to know what else he needs to do here. What Mark hasn't told us yet, but we'll find out soon, is that this is also a man of some privilege. He lives a comfortable life. He has what he needs and then some. In other words, this guy is an awful lot like, well, like us. Nice guy, has some cool stuff, wants to be close to God and is trying to figure out how to do that. And to this man who is an awful lot like us, Jesus says, come, follow me. Notice that. This is a call story. And as far as I know, this is the only call story in the Gospels that ends in failure and grief. And let we who are comfortable take note. The reason for that failure and that sadness and that grief and that inability to follow is money. The thing that causes a person to be unable to commit to following Jesus is their money, their possessions. The things they have get in the way of being a disciple. This is revolutionary. In, in this time of Jesus, as well as so often in our own time, wealth was considered a sign of God's favor. It meant you were doing something right. You're prosperous, you're blessed. I mean, really, how often do we look at something good that we've got? Our house, our full pantry, our ability to take a nice vacation and say, oh, I'm so blessed. God has blessed me with these things. And here's Jesus turning it all upside down and saying, no, that's actually what's keeping you from receiving God's blessings. You've got to get rid of all that stuff. No wonder this decent bloke walked away grieving. How does one get rid of the things when the things have seemed so good? And more than that, it's not just about changing your relationship with stuff. It's about changing your relationship with people. Jesus doesn't just say, get rid of your stuff, but give the money to the poor. It's about widening our gaze from the things we own to the people around us, the people who need us, the people who we also need. It's so, so easy to turn our attention the other direction though, right? It happens so often without us even really realizing it. There's a great story that illustrates this. It's about an abbot and a monk. So the abbot was the guy who ran the monastery, and he welcomed this new monk into the community, and he, and he let him live in his own lean-to down by the river. And each night, this young monk would wash his one robe and put it out to dry. And one morning, he was dismayed to discover that rats had torn his robe to shreds. So he went into the, the next village and he begged for, for another robe and that one was destroyed by rats too a few nights later. So he thought, well, I'll get a cat to deal with the, the rat situation. And then he found he had to beg for milk for the cat. Well, to get around that, he got a cow, but of course that meant he had to have hay. So he got the hay from the fields around his hut, and that meant he needed to get workers to help. And soon he was the wealthiest man in the region. 
Several years later, this abbot came back to find a mansion in place of the hut, and he asked the monk, what is the meaning of all this? Oh, holy abbot, the monk said, there was no other way to keep my robes. It's so easy to collect more and more, and so easy to justify why we need it. But the more we're wrapped up in taking care of ourselves and our things, the further we move from God and what God wants of us. Every self-serving obligation prevents us from helping another, from being a part of the transforming of the world around us. Indeed, Jesus says it's easier to shove a fully loaded dromedary through the eye of a needle than it is for us to truly live into God's kingdom. But that's not the end of the story. Because when Jesus interacts with this man, we read that Jesus looked at him and loved him. This is the only place in Mark where it says that Jesus loved someone. Jesus talks about love a lot, right? He says we should love God and love each other and make ethical decisions based on love. And Jesus criticizes people for loving the wrong things, but rarely are we told about Jesus' own feelings about other people or about anything, really, especially in Mark. He's just kind of going around telling reign of God stories and making reign of God things happen. We don't know what he's thinking. And yet here in this moment, we get a glimpse of Jesus' own heart. Jesus loved him even though he didn't get it, even though he was still trying to earn his way into eternal life by what he did, even though his wealth was preventing him from seeing a much more wholehearted way of being human and living abundantly, Jesus loved him. The center of this story is Jesus' love. The center of this revolution is Jesus' love. The message here is not Jesus loved him, but he was wealthy, and that was a problem that needed to be solved for this relationship to go any further. And it's not Jesus saying, be poor because I only like poor people. No, what Jesus is saying is, your wealth is problematic for you, and because I love you, I wish for your flourishing. Jesus doesn't call us to hard things just for the sake of doing hard things. Jesus calls us to hard things because he loves us. And he wants us to be able to love fully, too. He wants us to be able to truly live knowing that we have a God who looks on us with love, a God who saves us. Think of how much then we can be freed from things that bind us. Think of how revolutionary we can be with our money, with our stuff. We don't need it. We can give in a radically generous way. We can unburden ourselves from the materialism that weighs us down. We can move from getting to giving. We can unclench our grip on the things that we want to hold on to so that we're open to receive what God has to give us. And so we gather each week as a church. And we do our best to make this place a learning lab for love a place where we can practice radical generosity, revolutionary interdependence, rebellious nonviolence. We may find it impossible to consider the revolutionary actions Jesus calls us to, but all things are possible with the God who loves us. So this Lent, We're going to join the revolution. The 
bad news, it'll take more than an hour. But the good news is that it just might transform your entire life. Amen.